All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Anderson Business Advisors podcast. We got uh, Eddie Gann here today. Uh, this is also a subsection. Uh, we've got uh, Bowman's Business Brief. And today we got Eddie Gant with Jet Landing and uh, Jet Landing. And we've got, uh, uh, we're going to pack this half an hour to 45 minutes full of uh, great little nuggets. Wanted to get Eddie on this podcast because we've been following Eddie for years now. And he's got great insight to a lot of uh, uh, real estate uh, investors and in ways that he can help them out. So welcome, Eddie. Hey, Michael. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Yep. I'm up here in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, right up at the base of the mountains. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balmy uh, 30 degrees out. Well, I'm in Houston, Texas, and it's a balmy 75. We don't have too many mountains to look at from where I'm at, though. That's right. That's right. So, Eddie, to give our audience a little background, uh, tell us about what you guys do. Well, um, I'm one of the co-owners of Jet Lending here in Houston. We're an asset-based lender. Uh, we've been in business for a while. Uh, January 1, uh, I guess six days ago, uh, marked our 16th year uh, anniversary of being in business. 16 uh, years. 16. We've made it through one big downturn and a couple little minor downturns. So we've got, we, you know, we're kind of seasoned veterans down here in Houston. You know, every time I run into a business owner that's in business longer than five years, I always tell them that's something to be really proud of because, you know, most businesses, as you know, come in and come out, uh, you know, three to five years. And once you make it past the five, you got to be proud, Eddie. Well, well, thank you. I mean, you read the statistics and all of the business journals X percent of businesses fell in the first five years, three years, whatever. The number's high, as you know. We, um, uh, we're proud of it. And we actually started in the real estate business about five years before we actually uh, started our asset-based lending. We started here uh, as a house-living operation, and we're still in that business operation here in Houston, moving, buying, and fixing up um, distressed properties here in Houston and in Austin. And um, we watched the market for about five years before we made that big leap as a lender. So we've got that we've got that background of being in the real estate business, being real estate investors. I'm a REMAX agent. I'm actually a REMAX Hall of Fame or whatever that means. I guess it means I'm old, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, that, that actually was probably one of the keys when we hit that big downturn in 08 you know, not only to stay afloat and make it through it, but we honestly, we, we, we turned the profit in those years. Well, and knowing your guys' business model too, I think that's what makes you guys key is you guys have a firsthand knowledge and experience of what everyone's going through. So you talk the same language. There's been a problem with financing in uh, some of our clients where they couldn't get financing because the banker didn't talk the same language. They didn't understand what the actual investor was trying to do or the different types of income. And uh, I, I, right as you said that uh, you guys have experience in the actual industry, that's huge. Yeah, we're, I had a, one of my really good friends who uh, runs a rather large company in Austin, Texas. He, he, he said this to me one day in a, what I'm about to describe. And at first I thought it was an insult. And then I thought about it, well, it was, I guess a compliment. He said, we were dirt smart. <laughs> so I guess we are, we're dirt smart. around. Absolutely. You know, it, it does, it, 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 it helps you evaluate, because so an asset-based lender, there's multiple forms of protection, but the number one is your collateral. If you, yes. If you don't have the value of the collateral that you think you have, if unfortunately you end up with that piece of property back in your inventory as a lender, you know, you better be able to get your money back out of it. If you can't, and it happens too many times, you won't be in business very long. Uh, that's correct. Um, and also, you understand what the, uh, uh, the, the, the actual person is going through doing the deals. Um, you know, a traditional finance company, uh, they're going to want uh, your right arm, your DNA sample, uh, you know, letters of explanations on everything, uh, you know, tax returns from even, uh, you know, 10 years ago, or they, and then they find one little thing, and then they go down that tr uh, trail, and it, 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 you can't figure out what, why they even want this information. Uh, so at least you have some insight to uh, uh, to what they're going through and actually, actually request documents that are pertinent and pertinent to the actual property they're actually trying to get the loan against, right? That's right. Let, let me give this little, little analogy on it. We, you know, I've talked to a lot of bankers. We built jet lending around the community bank line, revolving lines of credit. 
is very different from most hard money companies. They most of them have a reg D fund and they raise private money. We, we raise our money through banks primarily. Yes, we have uh, a raise through, uh, through private, but mainly we, we get our money from banks. But when I meet with new bankers or I meet with the, with the Wall Street guys or the West Coast guys that's got funds, they, a lot of times the new banker thinks someone comes to a jet lending and asset-based lender because they have bad credit. That is not the case. No. Uh, if somebody looks at our loan tape, they are honestly very surprised at all the, the 700s, the 720s, the 740s, the 690 credit scores. Yeah, we got we got a few on there that's low, but but for the most part, they're high credit people. So they think, well, okay, they they don't have any money or have any income, so they come to us. That's that's not it. The number one reason someone comes to an asset based lender is and there's multiple reasons, but the number one reason is speed sure. of the game. They cannot. They're getting this heck of a deal on a piece of property that they promised the seller in order to get that discount. We'll close it in seven days. We'll close it in 10 days. We'll close it in 15 days. You cannot go through the traditional lending, a, con, a conventional lender for that for that loan. It's never going to close. So never going to close. I mean, we're. I just actually purchased another property uh, with a conventional based lender, and I had to go through a few to get the property closed quickly. Uh, one of them was a month and a half out. Mm -hmm. A month and a half out. Yeah. And you know, in a hot real estate market, you can't wait a month and a half to close. The seller's not. You know, if it's a great deal, the seller's not going to wait around for you to get the financing lined up. That's right. So the investor come to us mainly for the speed of the game, and yes, they're going to pay a little bit more for the money. But it's not as much as you think in most situations, meaning, you know, they're going to borrow money from me for 60 days, 90 days, maybe 180 days, could be longer depending on the project. But if you add up the incremental additional cost of that interest over 180 days or 90 days, uh, you know, the bank money's not free. You know, you have a certain, uh, you, know, you know, a ground basis of the interest you're going to pay there. So you pay a little more for an asset-based lender, but when you total it up, it's not that much more, and they was able to get in their deal quickly and safely without losing their deal. So they're not going to risk a couple of thousand dollars worth of interest payments when they're going to pop that deal for tens of thousands or greater profit when it's all said and done. That's what the the student investor is going to do. Well, yeah, and, and getting the deal done earlier, waiting around. Uh, there's an opportunity cost there too. Doesn't matter if you get a lower rate, you know, which saves you pennies. Uh, you're actually going to be able to get that deal done and move on to the next one. That's right. That's right. And in addition to the speed, you know, a high percent of the properties, not all, but a high percent of them are distressed. They're, they may be in poor condition. And if it's multifamily, it may be unstable. They got to get in and stabilize it. But a traditional lender is not going to want to lend on a, on a, on a property that doesn't look good and smell good, you know? So that's that's another avenue we come in and we'll loan them those types of properties. That's what actually impressed me also is when I found out you go out and you actually take, a, you'll lend on the actual deal, the property, as opposed to the person, correct? I mean, you, and you guys even do some sort of analysis, which is another pair of eyes looking at the deal, right? That's right. And we, we have a term called second eyes here. It's a, we're, we're a second set of eyes, but we're also- Oh, you actually call it that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, again, when I keep, you know, I've done some research, uh, you know, over the, you know, the time we've been together, and it's like uh, to get another pair of eyes on the deal is invaluable. Well, and that's right, and and, and we're a safety net, and I'm kind of jumping around just a little bit, but but we're a safety net, and what I mean by that is, you say you got a, maybe a rookie investor, or maybe someone not so seasoned, or maybe he, and that person just he or she just doesn't really know. Is this a deal or not? <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're a rookie or a seasoned person. Sometimes that old emotional attachment, and you're not supposed to get emotional with your investment investments, but I do. And uh, having another objective person, my wife laughs and she says, "Michael, you tell everybody about everything we you know invest in and get into." And I say, "Yeah, you know why have only us looking at it? Why not bounce it off you know our whole network and then get an opinion back?" And then you kind of boil it down and then you got, a, you got the truth behind it where there's no investment or there's no emotional behind the investment. That's right. And the real story here is if the asset-based lender says no to the deal, keep in mind, we don't make any money here unless we close the deal. Sure. There's, there's no money in not closing deals. So if we tell a client or a potential client, no, 
we're not going to loan on that deal. Or we'll loan on that deal, but not what you're paying. We'll loan a lot less than what you're paying. That's a that's that's a that's a safety action in place right there. Because if, a, if an asset-based lender tells you they don't want to loan them the deal, you're probably in a bad deal. Yeah. And and it eliminates that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the word again, rookie investor for making the catastrophic mistake of getting into a bad deal when his asset-based lender says, get away from it. Instead of getting mad at your asset-based lender, you give them a hug and a kiss. And a Christmas present. Cause I kept, oh, uh, thank you, you for not letting me get into a bad deal. Absolutely. I, you know, uh, it's real estate. The deals don't always make us money. Uh, but having another safety net that, that keeps us out of trouble, that's invaluable. That's right. And, and we'll coach them to say, get some type of due diligence period, get some type of option period, get some type of inspection period. All of those words are, are, are basically, they mean the same thing. Uh, it's just different terminology. But get yourself an out. Get yourself uh, the second eyes, if you will, to look at it, get your asset based lender to look at it to keep you out of trouble. Because what puts you out of this business is not the deals that you don't buy, it's the deals you buy. Those are the ones that put you out of business. Sure. And, uh, and there's many reasons to run out of, to go out of business of what we do. But the main one is you, you lose your liquidity, you spend all your money. Sure. And you not operate. You can be equity rich and cash poor. You can't operate. I'm a little conservative in my investing at times. And, you know, people say, oh, you know, being conservative, uh, do you, you know, you, you, don't, you don't make as much money maybe. And I always say, you know what, uh, being conservative, I probably have saved more than I would have made by being in risky and going out there and not, again, putting it through a network of people and not uh, doing due diligence and, and saying no at times when possibly, yeah, I look back and maybe I should have. But uh, just being a little more conservative or getting another pair of eyes is invaluable because then you don't get involved and then, then your liquidity doesn't go out and you don't lose a ton of money and you're not diversified. I, I agree. I, I, I know I have probably walked by good deals that I was a little bit iffy on that I could have made a lot of money. But I'll bet you I walked by a whole lot more than that that could have put me out of business had I sure. you know, just due to whatever reason. But um, we, we've, we've seen a lot of changes in this industry. It's, it's way different. I mean, I started flipping houses in 1999, and I've got about somewhere between 1,500 and 1,600 under my belt. Uh, so you were you were you were flipping before the flipping shows got cool, huh? <laughs> I say that all the time. It's like <laughs> I was country before country was was cool. Well, I was yeah. this before flipping houses was cool, and um, but yeah, I mean, the biggest difference now in the industry is there's lots of differences, but the main one is. When I used to go look at a property to, to try to buy it at a discount, very seldom did I have competition. And to be honest with you, I, man, I, I missed those. So you, every time you watch one of those flipping shows, you're cursing the TV saying, man, you ruined it for everybody. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, the HGTV has gotten it cool to be in and, you know, and everybody's out there doing seminars. It's a huge seminar market out there, as I'm sure you're aware of. And everybody else watching this podcast is aware of. But there's so many people going to masterminds now. There's there's eight or ten very large ones that's across the nation that are very sure. active. I know a lot of the people that run these masterminds. You know, they're, they're just grooming people for it. Now, that's bad for me in terms of going out and buying property, but it's good for me in jet lending because we have a bigger audience to, you know, to you know loan money to. And that's, that's a positive. But the biggest difference is, gosh, there's so many people in the business now, but that's a good thing for lending, a bad thing for your competition. Sure. And you know what? It just takes a little more work to get that deal. And as long you know, I always tell people, you know what, you're not, when you, when you get into flipping properties or into real estate, uh, you got to get the education behind you. And when you get the education, then you actually have to implement it. And you're not buying a money tree where you walk out every morning with your cup of coffee and your bathrobe and you, you know, you pull dollar bills off of it. And then when it starts dying, you wonder what happened. Well, no, you got to water it, feed it, fertilize it, uh, take care of it. And, you know, there are still deals out there. You just have to work at them and uh, pick the right ones. Well, you do. You, you, you got to accept early on you can't do everything. Uh, yeah. I bought over 1,500 houses. I, I, I can remember one house I put a paintbrush in my hand. You know, I just don't do it. You got to run the business like a businessman. Don't run it like a rehabber. You have to have business uh, partners. Anderson Advisors. You need a company like Anderson Advisors to help you. You need 
you know, you, you need the insurance company, you need the, you know, you need the roofer, you need, you need the structural engineer. You got to have all of these different people on your team and you meet these people at industry events. You don't, you know, you, you think it's hard to meet these people, but it's not. I mean, I think that's how we met you guys just through industry yes. events. You know, here um, we, we, so, we saw you around a few times and researched you and and uh, you checked out and uh, had great reviews, too. So, uh, you know, and, and you're talking about building your network out. And that's so huge. You know, finding good contractors. And I always say sometimes finding good contractors is like finding Bigfoot. You hear about them, but you never really find them. But finding those good contractors, speaking of contractors, Eddie, there's something about uh, that's, that caught my eye. Um, you know, we know contractors, they say it's going to be done in... X amount of time and it's usually double and it's over budget. Speaking over budget, what happens when you get into a deal and you need further repairs than you thought you did? Do you guys take care of financing for that? Well, we, we do we do hold a repair escrow fund for our mm-hmm. clients. And then we advance the monies to them as they improve the properties. And we go out and inspect to make sure the repairs are being done adequately with good quality. So we do have that program and it works fairly well. At Jet Lending, we have a full-time uh, field crew, sure. but we do advise our client when we're on site with them, maybe some areas they need to be a little more careful and maybe change their direction. Oh, oh you're kidding. No, we, we, we actually do that. So, you know, it seems, so, it seems so altruistic that, hey, you know, we, you get in there and you help them with the deal. But it actually is, is kind of, you know, like CYA also, right? It is. And people in the, starting off in the industry think the hardest part of the business is finding deals. It's not. It's managing contractors. That is the hardest part of the business. It truly is. So we do a lot of advisory. We do a lot of consultation. We're not the property manager for them. But an investor that's doing single family houses has to make a decision early on. They, do they want to hire a general contractor or do they want to self-perform and just hire the trades themselves and subcontract everything out? That's the decision they got to make. A lot of things go into that decision. The main thing is, do they have a day job? Do they work for Exxon? Do they work for, you know, uh, are they a doctor uh, that's getting into flipping houses or whatever? And there's a lot of medical people in this business. Sure. If you have a day job, you probably don't need to be self-performing and hiring trades. You don't have time to do it and watch the and watch the project. You hire a general contractor, so that's that's an advantage to hiring a general contractor. But you're going to spend more because now you've hired a man or a woman to manage the project for you. Absolutely. You, but you're keeping but you're keeping your main source of income and you're keeping your day job, and then you're building out another business at the same time. That's right, and 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 you've hired hopefully a professional to run the job for you, and you may be limited in experience. So that's that's a good thing. And that yeah. person's going to keep you out of trouble. Things if you didn't have the experience, and they're you're you're you're, you're going to run into that person if they got experience. They're going to keep you out of that trouble. Just like if you're a doctor, you wouldn't want a contractor coming in and and, and monkeying around in the the operating room, huh? That's that's right. And watch how the general contractor manages your project. That doesn't mean not ever be out there. That means be out there and watch what the general contractor does and how he manages the business for your for your for your property. Then after you've done two, three, four, five, six, whatever, you might be able to experience level to step up and then hire your own trades and sell what we call self-perform. And you save money by doing that, but your workload just went up because you're managing those trades yourself. So it's, you know, there's no right or wrong. It's whatever's the right fit for the right uh, investor. There's no right or wrong answer. You're going to pay more, but you're going to get help and expertise with a general contractor. You're going to save a little money if you hire the trade yourself, but your workload goes way up. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Hardest part of the business. Hardest it's, part of the business. So yeah. something I always like to cover with people, uh, you know, they're in the business that have uh, the experience. Uh, give me one of your biggest wins. In terms of a project? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, I got more than one, I think. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> one well, of the biggest I, wins. Let's see. What's what's one that comes to? Well, I'll tell you because it, it, it's interesting. Yes. Uh, I bought a house one time from a uh, Texas lottery winner. And really? I burned through, burned through, um, four million dollars in eleven months. I've never heard of that happening. You know the what? Is, what do they call the lottery curse? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he 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 hit the he hit the numbers. And yeah. He got, 
four four point five four point six million, and he had bought an upscale home, uh, paid cash for it, and and I knew when he bought it, I knew how much he paid because he bought it off the MLS uh, through through an agent, so I had the data, and I really didn't know why he was selling this property eleven months later, trying to get out of it quick for a discount cash. So in the conversation, walking around the pool, I determined that he um, uh, he told me that he won the lottery. No. And I remember I said to him, well, congratulations. And he said, no, worst blankety blank thing that's ever happened to me. It's he called goes, the lottery curse. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he said, he said four point something million. I burned all through it. My wife has left. She's got on drugs. It's a disaster. He said, I'm going to sell everything. I'm going to buy a travel trailer and park it on my daddy's land. And I'm going to be a heck of a lot happier. His exact words at the appointment. Wow. So, so I had made an offer um, that was pretty high. It was a high-end house. And he, he turned me down. And I raised a little bit. And he turned me down. And he raised, I raised a little bit. And he turned me down. Finally, I said, okay, that's, that's my top end. But this is what I'll do. If you'll trust me, I'll pay you this much money today. And then when I sell the property, I will, I will give you 20% of whatever my profit is. Oh, well. Okay. So he took that deal. And it was back when the market was bad around 09, 10. It took me a long time to sell that house. It took me almost a year. So we still did really good on the property. We made, we made about 100000 on the property. So his 20% cut was going to be around twenty grand. And he hadn't seen me in a long time. And I called him up and told him to come in and get his check. So he drives into my office, comes in, I handed him, it was roughly, it was 19000 and change, I think. Handed him his check, and he cried and gave me a hug. Really? And he said, I didn't think I'd ever see you again. I thought you were just going to screw me on this deal. Like everyone else in his life, probably after he won the lottery, it probably yeah. happened. And, you know, that, so, that, 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 that story actually kind of talks about real estate also. In, so a lot of people just look at the price, 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 but... In order to get deals nowadays, also, you got to look at terms. You got to look at other options outside the box thinking uh, will get you more deals and make you more profit, too. Yeah, it will. Um, you know, I like to, I, I use this old term I heard a long time. I'm, I'm a deal maker, not a deal breaker. Yeah. And the way you really do deals is sitting typically in the living room on the couch mm -hmm. or at the kitchen table. That's normally where you get your best deals, where you sit and visit. And yes. you find out why the seller is calling you in the first place. You know, what they told you over the phone, I'm not necessarily saying they would lie to you, but the story changes and gets more in depth as you sit at the kitchen table with them. And for an investor, and it's something I have to look myself in the mirror and check myself. Sometimes I have a tendency to get too big a hurry. But if you'll sit down at the kitchen table or the couch in the living room and slow down, you'll be amazed the amount of good deals you will stumble yourself into just by being patient and let the seller talk. And be a, you're talking about also being a human. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have something in business that I've had since I was about in my tw early 20s, uh, doing to others as you'd have done unto you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sitting down talking with somebody and making it a win-win situation. Too many times we look at it a win-loss or, you know, if, if you're not winning, you're losing. Uh, but, in Anderson, particularly, we kind of go by that guiding light of, you know, a win-win, you know, make sure the client wins, you win, uh, and do unto others as you'd have done unto you, which is a golden rule that's been around for hundreds of thousands of years, whatever uh, you want to you call it, uh, you know, and then you'll get referrals too. If you've done right by other people, people talk about you, uh, you know, when you speak of the downturn, when it, when it decreased in, you know, 09, you know, for, or for you know, what, for those three or four years, uh, you know, we expected our business to go down because we deal with small business owners. We deal with real estate investors and, and stock investors. Uh, we didn't see a decrease in our business. We saw a, a gradual slight increase even, which was phenomenal at the time, which is a big win. And one of the things I did was went back and looked at where our clients were coming from. And it was coming from word of mouth. And so, you know, if you do business and you get into the real estate and you do right by the seller, you're, you know, buying and selling and, uh, you know, doing others as you've done, done it to you. Uh, you're you're going to get more business. You're going to get people calling up. Hey, call up uh, Eddie. He does right by you. And uh, all of a sudden just snowballs. And, and that pertains, that business concept pertains to every uh, profession, I believe. It, it is. I mean, you look around, if you see businesses that are in existence for 15, 20 years plus, maybe not all the time, but I'm going to say most of the time you look at them, 
they're not out lying, cheating, and stealing. I mean, they're doing business no. way and developing a clientele. Down here in, in Houston, I think it's safe to say everybody knows who Jet Lending is. I mean, we're we're we're, we're pretty well branded in Texas. Oh yeah, uh, we're, we're not the cheapest. Let's just get it out on the table. We're not. We, we our our money is is a little higher than some other people's money, but you don't ever hear that we, you know, pulled a bait and switch on them at the closing table or 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 held back their repair monies or anything like that. It's it's all been on the up and up. And well, what are they, they're also getting value for that money? Maybe more expensive, but just the simple fact of another pair of eyes on that project. How much is that worth? Oh, it's invaluable because yeah. we we've had like I was talking about earlier with being the second eye. We've had clients get mad at us for telling them to get away from a deal. Maybe momentarily until they realize that you actually right. Most of the time, you hear back from them and you get the thank you. Thank I you. love the thank yous. Thank yep. you. I, you kept me out. You know, they know the business a little better now and reflect back on the deal and realize they shouldn't have got in it. Or they did it with somebody else and come back later and says, I should have listened to you. I should have yeah. got in that deal. It killed me. You know, so yeah, you just have to do it the right way. In my house flipping business in 2019, I bought, I don't know the exact number, 70, 80 houses, uh, 40% of my purchases last year were referrals. See, big believer. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. But this is a wonderful business. Uh, we you know, I can I, I can tell this like just by talking to you, and every time I talk to you about your passion, about the the the, the business, and about the people in the business, and I think that that uh, helps you be successful too. It is, and 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 down here in Houston, it's a close knit industry. Most of my social friends are, in, are real estate investors now. You know, just. Kind of got away from all my old college friends, I guess. But, uh, but did, anyway, did you get away from them, or did they get away from you? <laughs> one or the other. One or the other. But you know this because you've been to it. We put on an event once a month. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna ask you. I, I, that's something I wanted to get into because that's a hoot. I mean, I, I, I tell you, I love going down there. It's casual, as you can tell. I like to be a little casual. I'm in a suit all the time. Everyone who's probably on this has seen me in a suit uh, most of my life. Uh, but. Uh, Tell us about uh, uh, your meetup, uh, what is it, uh, at, at Republic, right? Yeah, it's at the uh, Republic Barbecue and Country Club. It's a huge country bar. It's, it's a very nice establishment, as you know. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a nice place. Uh, we averaged, well, we had 11 events last year. We had an event Monday through, excuse me, January through November. We don't do a December event. So we did 11, and we our average was over 800 last year. We 800 caught, people each one. What's that? 800 people at each event. Yeah, we averaged over 800 people per event. Our low mark was around 400 when Hurricane Imelda rolled through the same day we had the event. And we still had 400 people show up. And then we had over 1,000 three times. And then we had a bunch of meetings in that seven to 900. Well, what's the city? Where, where's, it, where, where's Republic again? It's in Southwest Houston, Republic Barbecue. Yeah. Uh, it's in the Southwest corner of Houston. Um, but we've been having it there for about, I guess we're going into our fourth year to have it there. We've been running this meeting for, uh, it'll soon be 13 years. Every month we do this meeting and we started out with 20 people. Now we've built it up, we're, we're consistently 800 to 1,000. It's darn intimidating if it's the first time you ever walk in. Cause you don't- Oh, I, I felt like it was walking in with a bunch of my people. I just walked in and everyone's so friendly. Um, you know, in regards, I got an idea in my mind. I want to see if we're congruent in this. What do you think the value of going to a, 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 those meetings are? Well, when you're new, you come there for education and networking and more than you are maybe the education is your experience. So we have two different, with the inside and the outside. The outside is where all the vendors and we have approximately 40 vendors now. And it's just a mass mob of people out there networking and talking to the vendors. And then the, on the inside, we have the technical presentation, and it's me or one of several other chosen ones that, that give the technical presentation. And it could be from managing contractors to how do you how do you um, how do you you know you know cash flow rental property. So it's a whole variety of topics that we visit throughout the year. But we'll have on the inside three or four hundred seats available. And they'll typically be full. Yeah. And out on the patio where the network yep. is, we got the probably the more seasoned people that maybe 
have heard the presentation before out there networking and doing deals on the patio and talking to all the vendors. So you get the best of both worlds there, but your typical newbie is going to come in and drink free beer and eat free food. It's free. <laughs> buy the free food. One of the secrets, I think, to get 800 to 1,000 people there to have free beer. But uh, that yeah. works. For us. But you come in and if you're, and, and every time, as soon as I take the stage, one of the first things I say, how many first timers are here? And we'll have, say, 400 people in the room. 30% of the people will raise their hand every time. So we're we're getting 100 to 150 first timers at every meeting. And then the other, you know, 800 people or 700 people are repeat people that come in for the networking and they do the presentations. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty cool event. We're, to be honest with you, we're kind of proud of it. You should be proud of it. I've been I, I, for decades. I've been going to these events. Uh, you absolutely should be proud of it because it it, it just fosters a, a community. And I think we're congruent in the, in the point networking. If you're getting into this business, you've got to network. You got to make sure you're surrounded those people who are doing the same things you are. Like I said about my wife and I, when we invest, we we bounce ideas off of other people because they'll see things you're not seeing. And why stick to your mentality when you can have everyone giving an input on it and, and surround yourself in those meetups and, uh, uh, you know, at, at groups like yours and uh, those meetings. That's what you need to do. You need to build that network to keep yourself out of trouble uh, and get those better deals. And then, you know, who's to say that you're not going to run into an investor that came across a deal and because you you're stand up, they're going to pass that deal on to you because they can't handle it that time. That's right. And, I, and I'll tell the new people this. I say, what should I do? I said, walk out of here with 20 business cards. Yes. Okay. And, and that's, you, you know, if you do more, it's fine. But I said, your goal, you should get 20 business cards. Then when you get home or in the morning, you email, make contact with those 20 people, and you add them into whether you're using um, Constant Contact or um, uh, MailChimp or one of the other services, you get them uh on your master database and you and you and you start keeping in touch with those people. We started that 20 years ago. We got 140,000 people in our constant contact. Really? We have 140,000 true active investors today? No. But some some section of that is, you know, sure. our, is our customers. We're 140,000. But we started with one business card way back 21 years ago. You know, you know I, I don't know what the actual saying is, and I hate cliches, but like the value of your uh, of, of you is like your network or what have you. Um, you know, it, it, it goes more than just that. It, you know, it, again, it's the synergy you have, you know, even, you know, at times, you know, in any business, you kind of get run down and maybe they give you the energy. Going Another point of going to those meetings, again, go to those meetings. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, you know, it re-energizes you at times. Too. Yeah, it yeah. really does, and especially this time of the year. Everybody's coming off of Christmas break. Everybody's excited. Everybody's ready to go. We're having the webinar here today. I mean, the, the podcast here today, you know, January the 7th. Everybody's, everybody around my office is energized today because we've all been gone for <laughs> you know, on and off for two weeks. So it's yeah. kind of, it's a fun time. And people it is. realize this, uh, you buy the most houses, at least for us here, and we got 20 years of records, January, December, June. That's your three really? months for buying investment properties for here in Texas. Yeah. Well, so fantastic. Just, December's gone. Yeah. It's January now. Okay. And then we'll, of course, we'll be in June, middle of the year. But uh, yeah, December, January, the two biggest months to buy investment properties. Perfect. All right. Just to recap, uh, so you guys do, do hard money lending. Uh, what are the terms again? What are generally your terms? Well, like, like month wise? Yeah. Let me give a ballpark because we'd like to know who our client is and what the property is before we quote the exact rate. And once we quote the rate, we give it in writing. So our client has it in writing. How many months though? Like what, what, what's the length of a... Uh, well, we do a two month loan, a three month loan, a six month loan, a 12 month loan, a 24 month loan, depending on what the client needs. Perfect. Like that two to two to twenty four. Uh, we'll do rehab for fix and flip. We'll do long term for rentals. And here's you now day one in our business way back in oh four. One hundred percent of our business was the buy fix and flip. Yeah. One hundred percent of our business today. That's fifty percent of our business. The oh. other fifty percent is the buy and hold for rental. You know, I, I, uh, those people are listening. It's, uh, Eddie's at uh, jetinvestorlending.com. Jetinvestorlending.com, by the way, uh, if you guys want to take a look and, and look into it for sure. 
in Houston, Texas. And hey, let me, we're awful proud of our partnership with you guys. You guys have been great. You guys have supported us and gave us a lot of advice. And, uh, and my clients, our clients, a lot of our clients use you. So yeah. uh, I think, are you guys going to do a workshop in Houston the first half of the year? We are. Yeah, it's coming up. Uh, gosh, I can't remember the specific dates. I don't have in front of me, but just you can go to AndersonAdvisors.com and, and look it up there. Uh, but yeah, definitely. I can't wait to get down there and uh, share a beer with you and uh, we'll, uh, we'll do all right. Hey, we really appreciate you, Eddie. And thank you for your insight. Uh, any parting words for uh, real estate investors out there? Don't procrastinate. Get educated and get involved. Awesome. Hey, Eddie, you have a fantastic day. Great talking to you and we'll see you soon. Okay, bye now. We appreciate all right, buddy. it. Thank you. Check it out. Bye.